A reading from our very first hymn. Now all the vault of heaven resounds. I want you to listen to part, part of it very closely and then I will finish the rest there here at the end. First stanza says, Now all the vault of heaven resounds in praise and love that still abounds. Christ has triumphed. He is living. Sing choirs of angels loud and clear. Repeat the songs of glory here. Second stanza. Eternal is the gift He brings. Therefore our heart with rapture sings. Christ has triumphed. He is living. Now still He comes to give us life. And by His presence stills all, all strife. Third stanza. O oh, fill us, Lord, with dauntless love. Set heart and will on things above that we conquer through your triumph. Grant grace sufficient for life's day that by our lives we truly say. And in the fourth stanza, adoring praises now we bring and with the heavenly blessed sing, Christ has triumphed, alleluia. Be to the Father and to our Lord, to the Spirit, blessed, most holy God, all the glory, never-ending. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This hymn is one of my very favorite hymns of all time. In fact, this is one that I have uh, reserved for my funeral. This is one of the ones that I... Uh, have specifically picked for my funeral. And if I had my way, I would pick this hymn for every funeral for every person ever. Because you are able to shout and sing on behalf of all the dead. The dead in the ground and the dead in sin. Those who have been re resurrected through the life of Christ... The vault of heaven has been opened unto us. Come unto me, and I will give you rest, Jesus says. And to the prodigal son, he says, Come into the embrace of your master, good and faithful servant. And throughout all of this hymn, we can see those themes kind of coming in and going out. Not by specifically saying them, but by saying the uh, affect of it. The very thing that makes all other things possible. All salvation possible. The vault of heaven has been opened. Therefore, the prodigal son is true for us. Therefore, the, uh, our own birth and baptism is true. All suffering and death of Christ is true according to the resurrection. If the resurrection had never happened, then Christianity is nothing. If the resurrection never happened, Christ dying on the cross was just Christ dying on the cross. And so we look for the open tomb because the open tomb is nothing more or less than the open vault of heaven. And peering into that tomb, we peer into heaven. And the same is true here at Augustana, which I was so excited to announce that we would be coming back together because we're once again able to peer into heaven, into Christ's church here at Augustana, where she has stood since 19... 04 technically, but where the building has stood since 1905. And here, God works. In here, at Augustana, you can trust that the true word is preached and the, administ and the administration of the sacraments is done so faithfully. Not because of me, but despite me. This is why we come to, 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 to church. Christ is the reason.
When we, when we look at, at the open tomb of Christ and, and we open and we look into the open vault of heaven and we look into the open vault once again of Augustana Lutheran, we can see the very first thing that people will see, and this is why I haven't changed the pyramids. The first thing that people will see is Easter, is the resurrection of Christ. So when we're done with our wandering, when we're done with our hiding, when we're done with our keeping ourselves safe from the virus, when we're able to come to church this next Sunday, we do so to see the vault of heaven on earth open. And we see it and we shall sing and it shall resound. But just for a moment, in that hymn, we'll keep that hymn in mind, just for a moment, remember this. The world will have no pity for, for you. The world will have no sympathy for you. The world will enter into you and explode out of you in such a way that you won't, don't even recognize it. By nature we are sinful and unclean and therefore we follow suit. We wear the uniform that we put on. If we put on the uniform of sin and malice and strife, then you will act according to your vocation of sin and malice and strife. If you put on the baptismal garment and you believe, teach, and confess Christ, then you will follow suit. Your uniform will represent who you are. Your baptismal garment will have you believing, teaching, and confessing Christ. So you, when you enter into the world, into out there, into our own minds even, well, not even even, especially, into our own minds, when we retreat into our own minds, into our own hearts, and then we look at the world and the world agrees with it and says, yes, you are a sinner. Even when we misunderstand Luther and say, Luther says, sin boldly. So that means we can go out and sin as, as much as we want, as long as we're bold. Well, actually, that's really bad German. It's actually sin and sin strong. It means that your sins are not weak. There's no such thing as a little white lie. That's what he's saying. Sin strong. When you sin, you are going to sin strong. Therefore, you need something stronger to take you from being that strong sinner. The world hates Christians because it hated Christ first. And I have to admit especially that I hate the world too. I don't know if that is right to say or wrong to say, but the truth is, in my heart and in my gut, I can't stand it. I'm tired of it. I'm sick of it. I'm tired of things being piled on time after time after time. I'm tired of the way that I feel about things being piled on. I hate the malice that I feel. I hate that I can't be in control. I hate that as a pastor, the world expects me to live in a certain way. And then also to live in a way where I need not repent of my sins because I would have none. As if that were something that were possible. I am not saying that a pastor should go out and live any way that he wants, but are you too not tired of being 
sick and tired of your own sin and sick and tired of the world and sick and tired of not being in control? Are you not sick and tired of doing evil? Are you not sick and tired of, of as it says here, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution? It is in First Peter. <clears throat> Whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. And we say, aha, because we believe that we are the ones who do good because evil is the one that's telling us that we're doing the good thing. And I'll give you an example. I know that's confusing. In this last Wednesday's Bible study, on YouTube, we talked about whether, whether the devil makes us do it or not. Whether the devil makes us sin or not. True or false? Well, I kind of gave a Snopes answer. The answer where there's a blurred line. It is false that he makes us do it. But it's true that he's really, really, really good at his job. He can make something look so good that it looks like it's from God himself. Where God builds a church, the devil builds a chapel. He can make a temptation look so good that they believe that God, himself, it's not even the devil, it's God. And then we go chasing after that. Antinomianism. That where we disregard the law of God because the gospel is so great of a feeling to us that it's actually spiritual dopamine rather than actual forgiveness of sins. If we ignore the law or hate the law, then the gospel becomes poison because we become Im uh, embedded in our own sin. Or in, our, in, 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 in not in our own sin, in, in the forgiveness of sins, without ever even having to acknowledge that we sinned in the first place. Antinomianism is one of the greatest tricks of the devil. The other greatest trick of the devil, of course, is convincing the world that he doesn't exist and that he doesn't bother you. That's a good one. That's boy, doesn't that fruit look good? Good one. Many people have looked over the fence to see if the grass is greener on the other side and gone over to have a bite of that grass. And soon, re understanding that they are sheep without a shepherd, find that the grass has been poisoned in the devil's backyard. I pray that this not happen to any of us. But I'm tired. I'm tired of a world that can't just be kind. I'm tired of a world that I help infect by my own sin. I'm tired of a world where I feel trapped, enclosed, cemented in, as if in utero, as if in something that I can't escape. And that the only thing that feeds me is that which feeds itself. Like a, like a baby before it's born. Trapped and feeling as if this is what all there is. This is all there is. Me in this, well, fetal position receiving nutrients from something I can't see. Ah. And isn't that, that's also why we understand that we're all knitted in our mother's womb sin, as, as sinners. 
and that we are born sinful until and the power of Satan until Christ claimed us as his own. And so I, I feel and I know that you feel that you are confined into this space and, and when we look out into the world, all we can see is our own little bubble, our own little in utero, our own little livelihood that matters to us, but we also hate because it confines us and doesn't let us control anything. Well, so it is. And I hear so often, buck up, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's just the way that life is. You take the good with the bad. I'm tired of all of those. What I would rather hear is this. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament but the world will rejoice. What I, everything I just said, you will be sorrowful. And so we are. But your sorrow will be turned to joy. You see, we are in utero and we are seeing this, this world, all that we can see as confining, constricting, and also uh, and also me-centric. In other words, selfish. The world revolves around me, particularly because I am confined. And then and, and all there is is nothing to but to but to be sorrowful, to mourn, and to hate the world in which you live in, to lament and to not prosper. And then all of a sudden, the whole world changes. Here come the cramps. And here come... Here comes the pushing. Here come the contractions. Here come... Here comes the breaking of the water in baptism. Here comes your exodus. When a, worm, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish. For the joy of the human being has been born into the world. And so we are. And so we are. In the world that we can see, we have sorrow. And even the angels in heaven lament our anguish. But they can see from a different point of view. Because when Christ says this, he's talking to, to his disciples and to us. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. So while the angels may look upon us and protect us, they see from a different point of view and they lament our, our horrible, worthless plot in life. But, they, but we can't see what they see, and that's this. The contractions and the pushing and the breaking of water in holy baptism is simply this Christ crucified died and resurrected and when we look into the tomb that is empty and we look into the vault of heaven that resound, that resounds we are also looking into our birth the pushing may be long the labor may be long, but truly after this world has ended and after our lives have ended, the angels, the archangels, and all the company of heaven rejoice for a new Christian has been born. 
no longer confined to this worldly garbage. Baptized into Christ, we are here and there. And so while we can see what we can see, the vault of heaven, or the vault of the, of the tomb, and the vault of heaven is the vault of the womb that bore the Savior. And the Savior, in His death, resurrection, and our baptism, makes us His bride. And the womb in which we are given birth and from whom, whose breasts we suckle from the altar. Again, and in case it's a little too, too graphic of a sermon for you, let me explain this. First John says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. I know of no child that has ever been a child that has not been, that has not been birthed. By nature of being a child, you have been given in birth. So, so, so see what kind of love the Father has that he, that he has given unto us. That we should be called the children of God. That we in this world would be baptized and that we would suffer not because, well, because it hated Christ first and made Him suffer first, so we will suffer. And so we come to Augustana, and I can't wait for next Sunday, where we, we may come to where the babe's nurse at the breast of the church. The reason why the world does not know this is that it did not believe, it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children. And what we will be has not appeared yet. But we know that when He appears, the resurrection of the dead, we shall be like Him. Because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. In other words, as we go through this life of gestation, we go through this life of pain, and, we, and even in our faith, it is in the resurrection of the dead that we realize that when we are once again reborn, when we are made to be children of God once more from the grave, we will know that we are not part of the world even if we are in it. What we will know is this, that when, is that we are children of God and we will know that we are the children of God when, we, when, when, when He appears. Why? Because after the birth and after living a life of difficulty, strife, and pure hell, we shall appear like Him. Because we shall see Him as He is. So when we stand in the resurrection of the dead, eye to eye to Jesus, what that's going to mean is that God the Father sees us as His own Son. Because He sees Him through the eyes of His crucified and risen Son, Jesus Christ. And that is how we are children of God. Again, my favorite stanza from this. Because I love the dauntless love. The love that is willing to endure all things. Suffer all things. Oh, fill us, Lord, with doubtless love. Set heart and will on things above that we conquer through your triumph. 
And then we pray for today. Grant grace sufficient for life's day that by our lives we truly say, Christ has triumphed. He is living. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. No longer does this world hold sway over me, for I am Christ, for I'm Christ's child. I am God's child, made, made so through Christ. Therefore, the devil and the world and all of its temptations can go back to hell where it belongs and be, and be vaulted in. For the vault of heaven is now open and resounding your baptism and looking forward to your death and resurrection so that you may be called the children of God. And as you raise from the dead, you will look at Christ in the eyes and you will see Him in yourself because that is where He resides. And He gives us this assurance in baptism and in the Lord's Supper. Adoring praises now we bring and with the heavenly blessed sing, Christ has triumphed. Alleluia. Be to the Father and to our Lord, to the Spirit, blessed, most holy God. All the glory never ending. Alleluia. 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 Amen. And now may the peace which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds.